hello and uh, welcome to the fuse box um, today i'm here with uh, dr michael williams from the university of brighton um, and i'll be talking to him as part of our engagement with the 5g festival um, for those of you who don't know the 5g festival um, is a DCMS funded project to deliver the world's first um, immersive, interactive, uh, internationally available and 5G powered music festival. Uh, the, um, the partners for the project include Warner Music, um, O2 Arenas and uh, the Digital Catapult. And the particular part of the project that Wired Sussex is involved in, working with Brighton Dome and Platform B uh, radio station, is called Alternative Stages. And Alternative Stages is really about how uh, audiences and fans engage and respond to immersive gigs, gigs in uh, the metaverse or gigs in virtual worlds. And that's the reason I'm today talking to uh, Michael. Can I call you Michael? Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, it's funny, but um, when I was first kind of doing some research, probably a year, maybe a year and a half ago now, um, into the issue of um, how uh, fans respond to concerts, I came across uh, Michael's research and... Uh, uh, it was completely coincidental that he happens to be in the same town, or same city, I should say, um, as, as us. Um, so, it's, so it's great to be able to get him in here at the Fusebox and have this discussion. Um, maybe, Michael, you could uh, start off by telling us a bit about your research and particularly what we're interested in from this point of view is how your research into the way that audiences and fans um, are part of uh, the process of creating uh, an enchanting or empowering or interesting experience in gigs, um, what you found out about that. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, first of all, to say I'm a, a music fan myself, and so when I was presented with the opportunity to do a PhD with the university, I... Um, I wanted to, wanted to try and explore my, my own experiences of attending, fan, um, uh, attending concerts as a fan and to try and understand those experiences. And um, so my research focused on the concept of spectacle, um, a, a term that is used in common everyday language. We think about firework display, we refer to it as a spectacle. Um, in the context of a rock music event, I wanted to find out what, you know, what does the term spectacle mean in the context of rock music events? And, and how does an event become a spectacle? And so my research focused on the fans' experiences and their contribution to that. And in, 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 in researching this over, over six years, interviewing lots of fans, attending concerts myself, I, I, my findings revealed um, three sort of overarching, overlapping themes, which were community and identity, enchantment and, and politics. Um, and being part of a, part of a, a, a fan group, I looked at U U2's 360 tour, which at the time um, you know, was the, the highest grossing tour in rock history. Um, it, it toured 110, 110 dates around the world. Um, and I'm a U2 fan as well, so that made it, made it sort of, uh, you know, more, more relevant and appealing to me to look at that. Um, I'm also part of, as a fan, part of a, a global community of fans. And, you know, my research revealed how these fans are, you know, are connected and interconnected um, around the world. So fans that are watching a concert in person are often communicating with fans in other parts of the world in different time zones. Uh, those fans in, that are remotely accessing concerts are, you know, are having set list parties, as they call them. So particularly in North America, um, you know, fans there gather around in someone's house and they'll make a whole event of this linked in with the event. And so 
um, fans at the event will be streaming the content out to them. And so I, I found that really, really interesting, the fact that there's a community of fans watching the, the event take place um, in, in real life, and there's those that are accessing this virtually. Um, but they're, they're connected as a, as a community, and, um, and fans also contribute to the event in terms of their, um, you know, their engagement in it, so their responses to calls for singing along and chanting and jumping up and down, and, and obviously there are fans that, you know, have been lifelong fans with a band like U2 that have, you know, followed the band for 40, 40 odd years. That, that know every movement and every, every sort of uh, tonal inflection, every sort of, you know, and can almost preempt what's going to happen next. Um, and there are those that are concerts that, you know, have perhaps, um, you know, never experienced it before. And so there's a whole dynamic, a whole set of dynamics going on with that audience, which my research sort of, um, you know, really sort of, you know, spent time sort of understanding the rituals, the practices that, of, of the fan groups. And, and uh, I think um, you mentioned you too, and you, 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 you quote from, uh, the, in your research, you quote from the tour manager um, of you two, talking about um, how uh, the goal um, of a U2 concert is to kind of create a sense of community within... Um, within the fans who are in the stadium or, or the venue. Um, and, and that's quite kind of interesting because, um, it, you know, it talks to um, particular strategies by bands to engage with their audience and bring them together and feel a sense of oneness, I guess. Um, which, what ways have you two actually uh, employed to, to do that? Well, I think that the 360 tour presented a unique opportunity in that um, the, the band were surrounded by their audience in most of their shows. And so they saw this as an opportunity to engage fans and explored lots of different ways. Their, their, their show director was very kind and responded to um, a number of questions I had. Um, one of the you know one of the ways that they did this was and one of the ways that they do this is is in terms of you know viewing their fans very much as a family as part of their extended family as a community rather than just paying commercial customers and so um, by bringing fans up onto stage um, which has become a sort of a feature of many artists of course but um, but that, that is a way of connecting with every fan in the stadium um, by, by, by sort of bringing one of, one of the family up onto stage. Um, by, um, by referencing a particular group that, you know, there's a group of super fans that travel around the world and, and quite often they've almost become, you know, celebrities and part of the inner family themselves and so they're, they're referenced as part of that. Um, but also by... Um, by having a leader so bono is a charismatic leader of that community and so you know can wave an arm and and you know signal to everybody to move in a certain direction or jump up and down those sort of moments of of charismatic leadership of that family are all contributing towards um, that sense of belonging sense of community um, as well as the fact that you know many of the the, the sort of die-hard fans of you know of um, uh, tour and I met you know I, I always thought my fandom was uh, was extreme but I've met people that it's all relative I, I, yeah exactly yeah. I, I met one guy that travelled to every single date 110 shows there took a sabbatical from from work and basically um, travelled around the world with the band. Um, wrote a couple of books about that experience in doing so. Um, you know, many other fans that have attended 80 shows over their sort of lifetime. And so they also far, form part of this sort of, you know, this inner group of fans. And, um, and actually there was a, a, a film. Um, one of the fans, um, as a film director, has produced a film about the U2 community. And, you know, how... U2's music and shows actually mean so much to fans. You know, they've helped them through illness, through loss, you know, and, and all of those aspects form a tight-knit, close community. Presumably not every 
fan who goes to the gig is a super fan, though. So I just wonder, you know, um, are there differences in the responses by fans to the um, ways that you two try to engage them? Yes, definitely. And, and that brings on to my s sort of second overarching theme of enchantment and how, um, you know, those fans that queue up for days in advance um, to get to the, the rail, as they call it, the front rail, so they have an unobstructed view of the band. Um, you know, this creates a, 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 you know, a, a really intense energy and atmosphere that sort of permeates through the, the venue. So I've been to concerts, I've been in that sort of general admission area right at the front. I've also sat right at the back and, and found it very frustrating to be sort of watching all of that energy and that excitement from a distance. But the... Um, you know, if we think about fans, you know, I used a, um, a typology of different types of fans. So um, from diehard lo and loyal fans to casual fans to those fans that are perhaps um, the term that um, I drew upon was dysfunctional fans that, that actually will you know, change their holiday plans, uh, borrow money, uh, do everything they can to get to a, to, to a show. And so the, the differing degrees of involvement in the, in the concerts and, you know, and, and different levels of knowledge about the band enable different levels of participation. So, for example, singing the words of particular songs, you know, the, the, those diehard loyal fans at the front know every single word and, you know, and they know they can preempt gestures and uh, perhaps guitar solos, those sorts of things, whereas other casual fans may never have heard those songs and therefore can't get as excited about them. So I, 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 this is a, a work that I'm currently sort of um, working on, looking at enchantment and, and thinking about, you know, the, the sources of enchantment. So obviously there's the music and the, um, the uh, production aspects, the lighting, the visuals, but then there's the role of the fans in sort of... Uh, in, 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 in their shared practices of, of singing along, um, of requesting the obscure songs that sort of the band, you know, hasn't yet played, um, or, or even elements of surprise and spontaneity when things go wrong, a guitar string breaks or something like that. Those sort of, those spontaneous moments can create this sort of experience of enchantment. It, it, it's, many of the fans I spoke to referred to a magical experience or a spiritual experience, something that those that perhaps were, weren't, weren't necessarily religious but, but couldn't you know, use the word spiritual to describe their experience as being something that for a temporary moment, this is something that takes them out of themselves. Um, helps them to forget about all of their day-to-day -day woes and worries, as, of course, concerts ca can do for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, uh, you know, one of the discussions that we've had around the um, 5G Festival and the Alternative Stages projects is that, uh, you know, often there's two elements uh, to, to a festival, and I guess a gig as well, but particularly to a festival, is one there needs to be some structure around it. So you kind of, you understand who's on what stage at what time, so you can kind of plan for that. You understand where the toilets are, um, you understand where the food is, and all those kind of things. So th there's got to be some formal basis to the thing. But equally, a lot of the most enduring value from a festival is the sense of serendipity mm -hmm. that you stumble across a band that you wouldn't have normally gone to see and they blow you away that you meet new friends for life you know that kind of stuff and that you know we've been um thinking about how you replicate that in a, a kind of virtual environment what you have to do to kind of prod people around that i mean in terms of your research around enchantment, you know, the sense of serendipity, the sense of unexpected things, and also the sense of planning. Have you, have you done any thinking about how those two things might actually work together in real life environments? Mm. 
In terms of the, the concerts themselves, um, I, I drew upon um, an idea of managed spontaneity. With, with a show like U2's 360, I mean, a lot of it is um, queued up in advance. Um, the, the guitar changes, the set changes, the, the set list itself is quite rigid. And so, um, but the, the, the sort of those moments of managed spontaneity where the band, you know, do something sort of slightly different from the previous night or, um, you know, they, they uh, perhaps change the set list altogether. I mean, the set list parties that I referred to earlier, um, fans very much scrutinise set lists and, you know, and, and look for those songs that perhaps, you know, um, that, that sort of don't get much of an outing in the set, that the band throw in every now and again. And it's those moments, or even parts of songs that are serendipitous when seemingly Bono will sing a few lines that he would only sing on certain nights. And those, those few lines have become legendary amongst the fan community. And so, and they're real talking points. And I think they also act as a draw, of course. People want to go and hear those particular moments within the set. So there's those sorts of aspects of, of managed spontaneity. And there's an element of that. But then within the fan community, there's also the sort of fan meetups around the concert. So, I mean, I've been to several, several concerts in different cities where, you know, quite often there will be an event the day, the day before with fans meeting up and then they'll meet up on the day itself, um, you know, in, in sort of either in, in, the, in the lineup. Um, and it's like a, a family reunion and sort of, you know, and the surprise there in terms of people having made it, you know, from the other side of the world that have mm. trekked all the way to Dublin or wherever. So there's those sorts of aspects within the fan community themselves as well. And, and there are a number of fans I know that, you know, have sort of set up their own fan groups and have become almost sort of celebrities in their own right, you know, that people now refer to those fans as being people that to, uh, to, to look for knowledge about the gigs, um, where to get a ticket, uh, those sorts of things. So I think in terms of, you know, things to think about in terms of the, the virtual environment is perhaps, you know, how those things can be, um, you know, because obviously there are lots of fans that aren't able to travel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th those fans that can actually engage in those things that are perhaps um, th facilitated more. I think, you know, often these things are facilitated by the fans in a sort of an unofficial cultural aspect to the event. But I think actually what you too, I think, have tried to do is, is sort of understand that and, and, and in a way capitalise on that, but also to be able to facilitate that sort of engagement with the fans. Um, you know, I'm aware other bands also do the same, but I think they've perhaps, um, you know, always been seen as pioneers in terms of their live shows, in terms of, you know, trying to innovate using technologies. And I think this is one other aspect where I think the band tried to sort of engage. So their 2015 tour, they invited um, sort of super fans from all over the world. Uh, at one point in the, the concert they did in Paris around the time of the Bataclan um, tax, that when they went back to perform there, they had about 10 super fans on stage. Um, that were all known to the die-hard fans, and they invited this group up onto stage, and, and it was a real sort of family reunion in a way, um, but a way of connecting with with fans across the world. Yeah, and I'm uh, and I'm thinking uh, it makes me think of um, approaches that other bands have have taken to increase the spontaneity or introduce spontaneity into, you know, an event which, as you said, it is often very structured. There's a set list, the huge artics have to come in, there's lighting rigs that go up and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm trying to remember, but was it Elvis Costello who did a tour where he just took requests from the audience and then would play that, you know, so that is really handing over the power of spontaneity mm. to the audience because he doesn't know what they're going to ask for. And, and a slightly different example, but you know, back in the day, the Grateful Dead would encourage people to pirate, first of all, encourage people to come early mm. and hang out outside and create tent cities outside the gigs, and then encourage them to pirate the gigs themselves mm. and record directly off the sound desk 
in order to uh, cascade the music yeah. out there. So it's quite interesting that some bands find mechanisms in order to make the audience more powerful in, in, mm. in the environment. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think that recognition that actually, you know, a show on its own without that level of engagement is, you know, I, I think as uh, Willie Williams mentioned, it's quite an, a, you know, an empty, hollow spectacle in terms of not having that sort of uh, level of meaning for the fans and that level of engagement. And so, um, and I think in terms of engaging fans in, you know, in, in the virtual realm as well um i think you know there's opportunities uh, i'm sure to you know to to expand this out to a much wider audience and and you know i'm interested in this interaction between the fans um i wrote about community the idea of community um the youtube community as i, I imagine other fan communities sort of tends to simmer away continually um and obviously during the build-up to a tour and the tour itself, it sort of comes to a boil, all of that activity, and it brings in the wider sort of more casual fans who also get drawn into it. But I think um, that activity in between times, I think, is quite important to, to um, you know, to, 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 to capture and to understand, um, you know, what goes on in those sort of fan communities that... Um, you know, the meetups. I think there was a meeting about three weeks ago of, of U2 fans in Dublin. Um, they had tribute bands playing there. Um, you know, they, they had their own sort of uh, venue that, that, that has become a venue specifically for these events. And so um, knowing all of that, you know, and, and understanding how to sort of, uh, how to communicate with the fans and how to, uh, you know, and, and, and how to uh, engage them in the shows, I think is, you know, is, is hugely valuable. Um, and, and I think, you know, many bands are really good at this. And as you say, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. Bands like the Grateful Dead and, and others before them have sort of, uh, you know, have, 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 have sort of recognised that. But I think the challenge now, I think, is is to try and sort of understand this at different levels, um, mm. you know, in, in sort of smaller gigs as well. You know, we've all got access to technologies now that um, not just seen as a marketing sort of a way of marketing concerts, but a way of actually building, a, you know, building a, a sense of belonging to that particular artist and a connection, which I think is, is, is really valuable. Yeah. And I think, you know, um uh, you, you're absolutely right that um, the opportunity around um, virtual and immersive gigs um, is many faceted, but one of them is that, you know, in a, in, in a world where there's a pandemic and climate change, not everyone can, can now, as those U2 fans did, travel across the world to see gigs. And so there's opportunities to engage in kind of new and different ways. Um, I just wondered, I know it's not directly part of your research, but I just wondered if you have any reflections on um, virtual and immersive um, uh, gigs, because we've seen, you know, through COVID, we've seen a growth in those. I think it's very early stages, mm -hmm. but it's a growth in those. Any reflections on the way that your research and findings might um, uh, give a direction of travel to those um, gigs, mm. and particularly in the way that audiences might become agents within the whole thing? Mm. I, I think, I mean, during the pandemic, I've experienced a whole range of different events personally that I've, I've sort of, uh, take, you know, that, that I've uh, um, spectated at, been part of. Um, and, you know, ranging from um, quite amateur sort of um, rough and ready type performances, which have been absolutely captivating, um, to, to shows that, you know, sort of are clearly a commercial, um, a commercial venture um, to engage fans. I think one of the things that my research has revealed is about, you know, the, the, the role of the fans in co-creating an event. And I think when we're actually all... Uh, in our own spaces, um, connected to something, but connected individually. I think it's much more difficult to feel that sense of being part of something. I mean, actually being immersed, you know, in, in an audience, being surrounded by other people to, 
you know, to, to hear them, to smell them, to sort of, you know, to feel the heat from them, you know, all of that creates atmosphere. And I think for me, finding ways of exploring that so that there's a sensory experience as well. One of our, our colleagues at the university has been working on a, a project with uh, Moomi gloves, I think they're called, but as a way of um, wearable technology that, that is a way of influencing sort of visual and audio sort of um, outputs. And I think actually, you know, if we're all able to um, you know, as augmented reality, as sort of uh, VR and AR headsets become more, more sort of advanced, perhaps as wearable technologies become more advanced, perhaps there's more opportunity to actually, you know, to be able to see people. I mean, U2 did the U2 3D. I don't know whether you remember, they did a 3D, a, a concert, I think it was part of their Vertigo tour, where they, uh, they screened this in IMAX cinemas. You walked in and you got your... Um, disposable 3D glasses, but you could actually see people in front of you as as the crowd who were dancing and singing. They were they they were part of the film. They weren't right. the people actually there. So it yeah. was quite it, it was quite weird because you could also see the real audience yeah. out of the side of the glasses. But those sort of moments where you actually feel part of the audience, I think, are really important and. Technologies, I'm sure, are advancing to the point where we can actually connect with those people but they're not actually there necessarily but yeah. but also you know that the, they can the audience the virtual audience can influence the atmosphere in some way in terms of their responses to the performance you know whether they be you know through uh, singing along as an example um, you know those sorts of activities give a sense of, of being part of something, being part of a community. And I think if we, if we can capture those sorts of things, I think that would be a real step forward. Mm. Um, you know, the, some of, the, some of the, the virtual concerts that I've seen are great because you get the opportunity to see artists in different sort of, you know, not in a big venue, but maybe in their bedrooms during the lockdown, singing very, very sort of, you know, uh, uh, intimate performances. But you don't get that sense of being part of a, an audience. Um, and that's, that's what I think perhaps, um, you know, was missing for those, from those things from, from myself. Yeah. No, I, th I think, you know, you've, that, that's a fair point. And, um, and I guess to some extent the, there's the question about how you might recreate that or that you just accept that um, the immersive experience has got a different experience. Mm -hmm. So it's got different... Um, advantages. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, an immersive experience, the audio can be far better mm -hmm. than in most gigs. Um, uh, you know, there's no queue for the toilet usually and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and yes, you, you could, you know, in theory, you could go and see a grunge band in an Australian venue that you would never at the mm -hmm. moment get the chance to see. So, it, it's, it's kind of early days, I mm -hmm. think, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But but definitely connecting with all of those other yeah. people that yes, are exactly. in, that, in some way, I think would, yeah. you know, would certainly, I mean, in terms of my research on the, the creating a spectacle, a spectacle is, is not just about sort of, you know, the, the lights and the, the sound, it's about the scale of the event, it's about the involvement of the audience, the movement, the action, yeah. excitement from the audience as well as the band. Yeah. And, and so. there may, may, you know, you talk about um, set list parties and there, there may well, um, be a difference um, with people collectively v engaging with immersive a uh, virtual event or individually engaging mm. with it and that would be quite kind of interesting so you know if there's a bunch of you um, in a house with beers all kind of engaging mm. together you may feel connected at least to some degree in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do if you were kind of sitting in your bedroom all alone for instance yeah definitely and i think that's how these set lot the set list parties you know that's the idea of them that actually fans that can't be at a show you yeah. know across the atlantic or wherever you know would get together so that actually they they still have that element of singing along together and you know having a beer together yeah. or whatever it may be so yeah no, definitely. Okay, well, um, I'm afraid we've, we've, we've kind of run out of time now. I mean, this has been really interesting. Um, and, you know, um, uh, thank you, Michael, for coming along and talking to us today. I, you know, I'd be really keen for you to kind of keep in touch with us and because I do think we're at the very early days of solving 
a lot of the technical problems around immersive technology. And the key thing is that we don't forget that uh, there are kind of social and human engagement uh, challenges that we also have to address it if it's going to be something mm. meaningful for people um, rather than just a, a, a brief novelty um, is, is the way I'd see it. We've got um, a number of other events around the whole um, Alternative Stages uh, program. Um, and if you want to catch up with what's happening uh, next in terms of live events, streamed events, or videos, then uh, please check out the Wired Sussex website, um, the uh, URL of which may well be below me right now. Thank you very much, and thank you, Michael. Thank you.